um, it's preparing to stream. And then what I will be doing too, as soon as it comes up, I'll be able to see it. And if there's questions that come up, I'm going to try to, I'm going to attempt to kind of follow those. It's, it's hard okay. to do that. Yeah, it's hard on the chat. Yep. Okay, let's see here. So it is live. And I just want to turn the, I'm trying to remember how to turn the, I got to do this more often. I'm hearing the audio from you and the video. So it's all echoey. Okay. So I just, oh, there it is. Okay, cool. So now I'm good. So now I'm just going to ignore the, the YouTube thing, but I'm going to watch the questions. Okay. So, um, if you're just joining us, um, we are going to be talking. This is Don Smith, uh, my my very old friend. He's older than me, so I can say that. Yeah. Um, he's uh, we're both kind of same DNA. We both come out of newspapers. We're both former sports photographers or whatever. I don't know if I'm former yet, but I'm working on it. Um, Don is a very, very, very accomplished landscape photographer. Um, he's incredible behind the lens. Um, he's got more patience than I do. Um, and he's also kind of an expert on toning or what we would say, like handling the files after they've been shot. And mm -hmm. so what I've asked Don to do tonight is to come on to YouTube live, uh, with me and what he's going to do is we're going to talk at length about the difference between the A7R4, which is 61 megapixel, but an older chip design, an older sensor uh, type versus the A1, which is brand new, brand new sensor, brand new camera um, at 50 megapixels. So it's like A7R4 versus A1. It's 61 megapixel versus 50. And it's the, you know, the gobstopping massive awesome processor of the a1 versus the slower older a7r4 so that's what we're going to be talking about tonight and then don has some amazing pictures that he sent me that we're going to kind of look at and stuff that he shot with the alpha one and if if we have time at the end we're going to go ahead and i'm going to i'm going to have john down share his screen and he's going to actually show us his process for toning which i'm pretty interested in as a, as a kind of a recovering sports photographer, I'm still doing things really fast, but not maybe the best that could be done. And so Don's going to show us how to do it right. I think so Don, thanks so much for coming on with me. I appreciate it so much. And oh, this um, is great. Yeah. I'm looking forward to doing this. Yeah. Yeah. I think so. Um, so the first thing is I wanted to, I want to be fair because a lot of people own the a seven R four and I get tons of questions as I'm sure you do from people wanting to know, should I, should I change? Um, we've all made amazing photographs with the A7R4. It is incredible. It is the largest sensor that we have access to right now in the Sony ecosystem. Um, so just talk a little bit about what the A7R4 meant when it came to market, when it came in the launch. Um, what did it mean to you as a landscape photographer? Yeah. Um, yeah. With, with, with the 60 megapixels, that that's a huge thing, but from a landscape photographer's perspective, um, we're, we're much more concerned with dynamic range. And that uh, is the, it's the ability for the camera to try to replicate human vision. And if we think in terms of contrast ratios when we're out and about shooting, uh, and that's the ability for our human vision and brain to decipher information in shadows and in highlights. And how does the camera translate that? And the, the best sensors on the market, which you know I'm biased, I happen to think Sony makes, we're still not there. We're, we're getting closer with every iteration of camera. This camera, which I'll talk about in a little bit, has a bit of three dimensionality going on with the files that I'm finding hard to comprehend how the engineers are doing this, but I'm absolutely loving it. And uh, it is a markedly different type of file 
than what I'm seeing off my A7R4. And I still have my A7R4. Um, it's, but I can tell you, I've been on three landscape shoots since this camera has arrived. I, I was a little bit late to the party. And then I was up in Oregon for two weeks with former with a uh, with another artist, and I don't want to say former, a uh, current artist and Gary Hart, and we were running a couple of Oregon workshops up there, and, we, and the camera actually arrived, Patrick, the day after I left to go to Oregon, and I was up there for two weeks. So instead of having it shipped up to my one of my six hotels I was staying in, and run the risk of getting it lost in the shuffle, you know how that goes. Uh, I waited till I got home and there was the ASA or the Alpha One waiting for me. And within two days, I was up in Yosemite. And these are going to be some of the pictures we're going to go through tonight. Um, and, and I'll talk over uh, what I was seeing. I was like a kid in a candy store <laughs> with this new camera. Well, let's, let's start the conversation. I'm going to ask a question every once in a while just to kind of prompt you, but I really want to know what you think because I, I respect you so much and your work is so. Well, I appreciate phenomenal. it. Um, talk about like the difference between 61 me megapixels and 50 from your perspective. I mean, is it, are we getting, are we losing a lot? Or? No, no, I, I really don't think so. I, I, you know, um, I talked to the Sony engineers as you do. Um, we haven't been able to obviously for this past year with COVID, but there's, as you know, and I don't know how much the audience knows, there's far more that goes into the creation of a file simply than what the sensor can record. It, it's, it's the processor, it's the wiring, it's the circuitry of the camera. It, it's how it's all put together. Everything, every step along the way contributes to that end file and how that end file looks. And so to just merely, when people come to me and say, well, this is a 61 megapixel sensor, and now you've dropped down to a 50 megapixel, you've lost 11 megapixels. I think what we've made up in the performance of the file, the resulting file, uh, I'm not going to lose any bit of sleep over uh, 11 megapixels. Um, I just think the, the files, again, are so much uh, markedly different. Uh, than the a7r4 and that's not to put any any uh, kind of damper on that camera that's a phenomenal camera for those of you that are still shooting with the a7r4 i'm getting in the landscape world i know you're getting the questions from the sports world i'm getting yes. <laughs> hey is it time for me is there going to be something beyond the a7r4 or should i upgrade to the alpha one that's a question i can't answer none of us can um I mean, I, I, I'm just like everybody else. I go out and look at the rumor sites and I keep hearing of uh, these huge sensors coming down the line. But uh, I, I, it's always been my belief that camera companies can, um, they can market megapixels because megapixels is something the average photographer can understand. You start throwing in terms like dynamic range and again, that's the that sensor's ability to try to replicate what human vision can see as far as shadows and highlights and all the all the, the, the colors and tones in between. You're on a whole nother sphere from just worrying about a difference of 11 megapixels in my book. I, I, I can make, you know, there's software out there that allows us to take these files up and I could make prints wall size if I had to for a gallery. I'm not in the gallery business. Um, I, you know, I'm doing workshops, and then all of my imagery is represented by Getty Images, and um, so that's where I'm at. If I owned a gallery and I wanted to make these huge uh, enlargements, I wouldn't hesitate with the Alpha One. I think it would come out every bit as different, every bit as good, if not better in performance than the file off the A7R4. Just my beliefs. Yeah, I'm in the same boat. You are uh, in the sports and portrait sort of realm. Alpha One is better than an A7R4 in every respect, especially regarding autofocus. I mean, it just oh, doesn't miss anything. Uh, I was shooting uh, a portrait when I first got uh, one. I, I, they sent me one to borrow to, to check out. 
and I was shooting this portrait and, and um, it was completely backlit. There was a woman in a, in a, like in a living room situation and behind her were three windows. There was a light on in the room behind her up high on the ceiling. There was no light on my end. And um, so I was shooting into complete backlit and it just nailed eye, eye autofocus the entire time. Yeah, it was phenomenal. It, it just blew me away. It was just ice cold how good it was. Well, so the, the autofocus combined with so that's the other thing I've had, you know, a lot of discussions with people shooting a seven R four and a lot of birders. They want they're greedy for that that real estate on the sensor. They're greedy. <laughs> yeah. And yeah, they're okay. they're unlike unsports people don't care, but like they're greedy. And I keep saying to them, hey, what good is a bird in flight picture that's out of focus that's 61 megapixel? You got it. Who cares? You, like you, if you got don't it. have it in focus. What's the point of that? <laughs> that's that's real world. That is real world. How a pro thinks versus a, an amateur is so spec oriented and uh, they, they, they will gross over these specs and just grab onto them, you know, and not to say that I don't look at them either, but, but these are just tools and you got to get the tools in the hands. And this camera felt so natural in my hand and the menus, we haven't even talked about that yet, right, are right, so right. intuitively laid out now. I think that's a, we can, we can bury that issue that Sony has a bad menu set up. They have a fantastic menu set up now, very easy to follow. And how good does that camera feel in your hands? And, and bottom line is what kind of performance is it giving you? And I got to echo your sentiment on, because I had the sports background, right? I worked for Sports Illustrated for a while and I was team photographer with the San Jose Sharks for 28 years. I don't shoot sports anymore. So people say, well, you know, what, what good is action and landscape? Well, there's a lot of times I'm, I live next to the Big Sur coast and I'm doing wave photography, bird photography. I was over there Saturday night. This is our date night. This is what happens with my wife, Barry and I, when we go on a date, I will always morph a dinner with a shoot, a sunset shoot. And I was shooting a sunset. How, how romantic is all I, I I'm say. just a, yeah, I'm just a romantic <laughs> kind of guy. And she's used to it. But um, I, I, so there was this beautiful flowers in the foreground, this flowering ice plant. And I shot that. And then we had the waves coming in in the background. So I shot one frame knowing I was going to mask it, blend it with the waves, shot a couple of frames, got the lighting the way I wanted, kind of skimming these flowers. And then I kicked over to 30 frames a second, started playing with the waves and uh, probably shot four or 500 frames of the waves to, to pick that one that, that was just the perfect timing that I wanted to blend with that foreground. So there's an example of how we're using autofocus in, in landscape also. Okay, I wanna to switch to color science. Um, okay. And you know, color science in my world, Alpha One is doing things in a low light where it's, it's retaining correct tonality. It's, it's retaining skin tone at 12,800 ISO. It's, yeah. it's, it's absolutely nailing stuff. Now, you are shooting, like sports photographers, we think we shoot in low light, but you are shooting moon bows for God's sake. Yeah. So, yeah. You're shooting in no light sometimes. So talk yeah. about color as it pertains to Alpha One versus A7R4. For well, me. this camera, it, it, it's one of the first things I talk about when I tell people when they're saying, well, what's the difference? And I say the color is this, this camera beyond any other camera I've ever had in my hand. And I, I don't care if we're talking Sony, Canon, Nikon, whatever. I shot all those other cameras. I've never seen more accurate, lifelike color rendition come off a file that I'm seeing coming off of these files. And like you said, well, um, when we start going through these images, uh, I shot from five in the afternoon till midnight. Uh, I just skipped dinner. I was so so engrossed with what I was doing. So I, I, I ran the whole range of lighting conditions and then went out the next morning and just shot in some bright sunlight that I didn't really like, but it handled those situations really, really well also. But the raw files are amazing to work with. Um, uh, you know, when I show a little bit of my workflow at the end, you'll see how I bring out certain things in the file. But I've always said, if it's not captured in the raw file, I can't go in. I can't go in and enhance, let's say, a red if it's not inherent in the raw file. If it wasn't originally captured. Yeah. 
Yeah. Um, we, we've come so far, you know, I had a, I was down in Florida shooting those spoon bills with, you know, for that workshop we're playing with Ron and I was down there and there was a, a nice older couple from Michigan and, and she was the photographer and he was the schlepper. It was kind of funny. They were a great <laughs> couple, but um, anyway, she had an A9 and I asked her, I said, Hey, do you, are you using punch in? And she says, I don't know what you mean. I started zooming on the sensor and she's like, no, I don't know what you mean. And I said, well, do you want me to set your camera to do it? And she's <laughs> like, yeah, I don't know. You know, so she had a 100 to 400 and, and an A9 yeah. and just a couple of things. I did a couple of things for her camera and it radically changed how she can shoot now, you know? Oh, yeah. And so I wanted to just talk about a little bit about how these cameras are a little bit future proof, how, you know, they, you buy the camera and it's a lot of money. $6,498 US is what an A1 will set you back in the United States. Um, but you're buying that camera in its current state, but you're also getting for free all the additional things that they do to improve it on the other end. So yeah. like, I know they're going to be doing firmware updates, uh, uh, that will give, make my life easier and make pictures better and video too. Um, it, it's just kind of cool because like when you buy a Sony camera, it's, it's almost like you're stepping into a river that's moving. And it's not really until you sell the camera that you get out of that river. Um, yeah. But the, but what I was going to get at is I'm, I'm trying to help her because you mentioned menus early. And I want to touch on that because menus are a big deal. So this is the first time I had an original A9 or what, what are now people are calling the A9 classic. It's kind of funny. <laughs> <laughs> it's the first time I had one in my hands in a long time. And I was amazed at the difference between the menus. I was like, oh my gosh, this is so bizarre. I couldn't find uh, anything because yeah. everything makes more sense in the alpha one menu system versus the older system. And that's going back like two, three generations in the menus to go to the original A9, right. even with its firmware updates. So um, I think getting around in the camera, like one of the, my pet peeves with all the Sony cameras is how they change the, where the format is in the menus. They move it yeah. around all the time. Yeah. Now they've got it where it makes sense. It's like right there where you can find it quick. Exactly. It's just, it's, it's, yeah. So once you, I guess the thing of it is the menu systems, people complain about the menus all the time, but I kind of want to say to people, Hey, don't complain because they keep changing to make a better. Yeah. And I do feel like they have gone, I think they've traveled the greatest distance with the alpha one menus and the ACE of our ACE seven S three. Those two menu systems are phenomenal. I, I got to agree. And I was one of the, you know, I got the A7S three early on. So I had a little bit of a head start on this camera and felt very comfortable when it showed up. But I think if you're brand new to this camera, um, you're going to get on to these menus. They just, they just are categorized. They make sense. Uh, you know, I, I don't have to kind of scratch my head and go, where is things? And having said that, there are 52 pages of menus and all their sub menus. And I just posted on my uh, YouTube site last week, the way I set my camera up to do both um, landscape and, you know, I'm at the beach and I'm shooting in landscape and then suddenly a flock of seagulls come by and I can be shooting at 30 frames a second. Um, it wasn't hard to set up. I know you and I talked a bit about this and uh, Gary Hart and I kind of kicked it around. And uh, it, it's really, uh, for anybody that owns a camera and wants, you know, wants it set up, Patrick has his way of setting it up. I've kind of figured out my way of setting it up. The beauty is you can, you can configure these cameras to what makes sense for you. Not, not, you know, just because Patrick's saying to do this or I'm saying do it this way, you have to find what works for you in these cameras. And I'm a real, I preface that video and I'll say it here. I'm a real minimalist when it comes to cameras. Um, I respect them as a tool and what they can do. And I happen to think Sony is the best at it currently in the game, uh, especially this camera. I think it's the best camera on the planet. And I, and I don't make those kind of statements very often, but you have to make that camera set up I don't want to be out on location thinking about, gosh, I need to do this. How do I go into that menu setting and do it? It's all got to be set ahead of time. I don't want that creative flow broken when the light's happening. And here comes that one and a half minute of great light. And I've got to be tuned into what I'm doing. That's not the time to be thinking technical. 
<laughs> you want yeah, you want to yeah. knock that stuff and nail it down and uh, have it where you feel very comfortable going out. And this camera just makes it very, very easy. I'll, I won't use the word simple, nothing simple, but it makes it exactly what you're saying compared to uh, an A7R4 or three or what, whatever of the older yeah. setups, things make sense where they're at. Like you're saying, where the format is. It just, yeah. it just makes sense where everything was put. Hey, in case you're just joining us, this is Don Smith uh, that I'm interviewing. I'm Pat Murphy Racy. We're both Sony artisans, and Don is a landscape photographer, and he's kind of helping us to understand better the difference between the Alpha One and the uh, A7R4. So that's that's what we're doing. Um, I wanted to also say hey to uh, our friend Jadu. He was in Canada. He lives up in Toronto. He's uh, an Action Link. Um, employee used to be with Sony uh, Canada, but he's a great, great photographer. And I know that he has used the A7R4 a lot. He does beautiful portraits um, up there. I want to say hey to Sander and Sonic84 and um, greetings. Uh, we've got a couple of people from uh, Germany on, which is kind of cool. That's awesome. Um, but anyway, yeah. So um, I want to like set your way back machine, Don, and we have a lot of way back, you and I together. <laughs> Um, there used to be a term in film technology that we used to talk about accutance. Yeah. And accutance was the, how you described the sharpness or the edges of grain in film. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I find that the, no matter what I do to an A7R4 file, it just seems kind of soft. And I find that the accutance of the Alpha 1 is so much better. Like there's, it seems like there's more contrast in the edges of the, the sort of the, I mean, I, and I'll, I don't see a lot of noise. And so that, so there's a two part question for you, Don, I wanted to ask you about how sharp you can, you know, how, how sharp is the alpha one able to resolve things? And then I also want you to talk about noise and uh, what you mm -hmm. found to be the, the sort of workable settings in noise in terms of ISO. Okay. Yeah. One of the first things that jumped out at me, Patrick, was how sharp these files were. Um, when I first got the camera, you know, I, I ran out in my backyard. I shot a little in my house just to get the settings down and I kept getting blown away because it was looking really good in the, in the um, LCD and the electronic viewfinder. And I, I really don't use an LCD anymore. I, I pretty much, you know, I, I leave it in auto, but, um, the uh, the new electronic viewfinder is is absolutely amazing, but the files transcend to when you put them up on a large screen on your computer. And there, yes, there is a sharpness that I've never seen with any other camera coming out of this camera. Uh, almost like they took the anti-aliasing filter and eliminated it. But uh, I, I don't know how they're getting it quite this sharp. And I was thinking, you know, I'm seeing it through my camera and I was real excited, but I'm going, yeah, it's a process JPEG. Okay. They're probably bumping in some sharpening. And then when I got home and I, and I put the raw files up, it was there. Every bit of the sharpness I was seeing through that camera was there. As far as the noise, and I tested it all the way from 100 ISO up to, I went the highest I shot that evening. We had a full moon up was 12,800. My test, and I've really gone over these backwards and forwards and really scrutinized them. As a landscape photographer, I would feel comfortable with this camera going up to 8,000 ISO, which is about a stop more than I felt comfortable going up to with my A7R4. You know, maybe not quite a stop. I, there was times I could take the A7R4 up to 6,400 and with the noise uh, reduction, especially Topaz, Denoise, AI, and uh, the DxO Prime noise reduction, either one of those softwares handled it really well. But uh, it seemed like 8,000 was the break point. When I got to 12,800, the file in a raw state for landscape started to go beyond where I would feel comfortable with it. But most certainly what you're doing with sports or if you're shooting indoors in a JPEG, uh, I think you can go even higher and I'll allow you to speak to that because I haven't really tested it beyond 12,800. 
Yeah, for me, I have no issue. The shooting this camera versus the A92 in low light, I go up to 20,000 without even thinking about it. Mm -hmm. 12.8 is really, really, really great. It's yeah, 12.8. Uh, yeah. But a landscape photographer is not going to be interested in shit like looking at my sports pictures at 20,000. So <laughs> <laughs> I, I get what you're saying is too. But isn't it cool? Like, isn't it cool that we have a camera that can do both? It, it, no, I used to carry around, you know, we both had the A9s and then I went up to the A9 too. Yep. I always, those were my cameras mixed with my A7R4. That was what I carried around. And now to think I got one camera where I can do it all. That's just, it just is for, you know, an old guy like me, it's blowing me away and, and, and how well it does it. And as I explained in the video I did, we're only talking about half the camera. We haven't even started talking about what it can do in, in video terms. That's, you know, right. that's a whole nother half of that camera that we're, yeah. that's not the purpose of what we're doing today. But to think that, that we can do it all in one camera, this is it just is an amazing, amazing piece of technology. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. Yeah. Uh, Jadu is talking about how um, the buffer is so slow uh, in the A7R4 and that when you're, when the camera is trying, like the, the A7R4 is extremely powerful. It has that ability yeah. to do the, um, you know, that the, where it smashes all the pictures together. What's that called, Don? I'm just brain. Oh, uh, you are you thinking of HDR? No. We, we no. never have had in camera Remember HDR. Remember the first camera they ever made was the A7R4 that did this. It, it gave us IAF and video, and then it gave us some, um, <laughs> I'm losing my mind here. Okay, you got Sorry. me. You're but anyway, me it's got pixel shift. Pixel, pixel shift. shift. Okay, so, yeah. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. So pixel shift it was introduced in the A7R4. Right. But right. when you see the A7R4 do pixel shift, it is really breathing heavy. It's breaking a sweat. It's Alpha One does stuff like without even changing idle. I mean, yeah. the RPMs don't even go. It's like a big diesel engine. It just sits right. there and it can pull an 18 wheeler down the interstate going 80 miles an hour out West and uh, not even break a sweat. So it's, yeah, it's kind of cool. Yeah. Um, but yeah. And I think um, uh, the other thing is the, a lot of people ask me about alpha one and, and whether the cards are really worth the money. Um, and for me as a sports photographer, they truly are like, I are. really, <laughs> I really, and I also use these for video. So like the alpha one is dual purpose for me truly, because I I'm an FX nine owner also, which mm -hmm. means I can shoot in S Cinetone with yep. the FX nine. And then I can use both of my alpha ones as a second and third camera to shoot also in an S Cinetone. Um, and for me, the ability to shoot at 8K or 6K or, you know, the, the super high frame rates in 4K, you know, 120 frames a second or whatever. But most of all, the still photography, the sports to be able to do rapid succession images, you know, uh, bursts at 30 frames mm -hmm. a second. Mm -hmm. Those S, those uh, CF Express type A cards are really worth the money. Now, if you're only doing landscape work, is that a big deal? Like, would you recommend people still buy those faster cards for the type of work you're doing, or is it okay to get, can you get away with it without them with the, just using SD cards? That's a great question. And I, I, you know, I was thinking about this today um, earlier before we went on and I, I believe you're going to ask a hundred landscape photographers and get a hundred different answers. For me, they're worth it. And uh, just, for this shot that I did the other night that I was telling you about Monterey with the ocean. I shot a couple of frames of that foreground and then I was just doing the 30 frames a second on the waves when a good set of swells would come through and there's just zero slowdown. You know, we, I think part of that, it's, it's twofold. We always had a good buffer on the A7R4. It was doing its job, but we didn't have the fast cards to match up with that buffer, to clear that buffer and write it to the card. And now we do, we have the best of both worlds. And again, it's that technological thing that the moment's happening. I'm in that moment, here comes that set of swells that I don't wanna miss. And I'm shooting them at 30 frames a second. I don't have to worry about my, my camera slowing down or the buffer getting clogged, writing to a slow uh, memory card. So yes, my answer is spend the money, 
get the faster card. But of course, I can spend anybody's money. You know, it's, it's yeah, yeah, it's, really, it's, yeah. I, I understand you guys, but if look at your if if you're going to drive a Porsche, <laughs> you, you know, you're not going to throw the cheapest gasoline in it, right? You That's you right. Um, you've made a commitment to get a camera that's going to produce some excellent files for you. Don't, don't hang yourself up by trying to save a few bucks on the memory cards. Yeah. Agreed. Well, I think they've heard uh, two old guys talking enough. Let's look at some of your pictures, Don. Are you ready for that? I think so. This seems so like this forever one? ago that I shot. Yeah. These, but it was well, only a week and a half ago. I yeah. yeah. This is the uh, breaking spring storm at sunset um and yosemite valley so let me let me figure out how to share my screen and we'll get right to it okay and i believe everybody should be seeing that is are you seeing that go. picture up now yeah awesome i glad i'm glad you put i'm gonna move um i need to move our little faces around here if you can shift it pat i can i can see the metadata here so that that's what i uh yeah i'm leaving I, it where I, you can see the metadata because i really yeah. that's very important yeah, this was one of the uh, places I first started in, in Yosemite. I wasn't even quite into the valley yet. Uh, this is up on Highway 120. There's three, uh, three ways to get into Yosemite, three different highways on how you can come in and out. I came up, you can see down here, I'll explain it. This, this river down here is the Merced River. The valley really kind of snakes around behind over in here. We're looking at Bridal Veil Fall right here. These are cathedral rocks. One of the, the very, um, oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, I'm moving my mouse okay. around, but you're gonna have to do it on your end. So just, just to kind of give you a setting where I'm at, and if, and if people know the park, they'll understand where I'm at. I, uh, there's two tunnels you go through and then you come out to an overview like, you know, that puts you right down the middle looking back. And, we were on the tail end of a very late spring winter storm. In fact, if you look at the snow line up there, it had just stopped snowing. When I first showed up, you couldn't see that. It was all under clouds. And then it started to open up. This was about five in the afternoon. And I believe sunset that night was about, oh, it was a little before eight o'clock or maybe eight o'clock. So this was about three hours before um sunset that i began shooting in the valley and uh should it, i assume this is a 24 72 8 or what is this this is a um uh, let's see so can you are you able to shift oh, it's got to be 70 to it's got to be a 70 to 200 i'll tell you what i shot let me tell you what i carry in my bag and i shot with every lens that night i okay. carry a, a 12 to um 12 to 24 F2.8, these are all Sony glass, 24 to 105. And then I had my one, no, I had my 200 to 600. So where I was missing was so this from is 24 one, to 105. This is 24 to 105. Okay. Yeah. I just want yeah. to check on that. Yeah. And because there's no immediate foreground element in front of me, when I come up to a landscape scene, I'm always starting at F11. That's just okay. a standard starting place for me. That doesn't mean where I'm going to stay there. If I need more depth of field, I'm going down to 16 or more. Um, okay. There's times I'll go at F8. Really, the scene could have probably been shot at F8, but I was a little concerned with that foreground ridge. I wanted everything to stay sharp from the foreground ridge all the way back out to those snow-covered trees. And you're 60 to the second, but it's obviously you're you're. I'm sure you're locked down on a tripod, right? I'm locked. Everything I do in okay. landscape is on a tripod. Yeah, yeah I'm not. I, I I think if you're going to be serious about your landscape. Uh, you want to work on the edges of the day and you definitely, definitely want to be on a tripod because you're going to be slow I shutter. liked what you just said, the edges of the day. That is exactly yeah. where you want to be. That's yeah. cool. Yeah, that's when the cool light comes. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. I, you know, we were talking about dynamic range before and you really see it here, like down here, yeah. these rocks, mm -hmm. see all this tonality here. Um, and then even to the brightest part where the sun is directly hitting the the mountains and below yeah. you know, above the falls. It's just, it's cool. You really see yeah. it. Now you gotta, you know, you gotta remember too, these are all my files have been worked on. I think that if yeah. I can remember the, the hardest thing that I had to work on were the clouds up on the top left where they brightened up. 
Okay. But later on through this presentation, I'm gonna show you a little bit about luminosity masking and they were brought back under control utilizing a lum. I, I work with luminosity masks all the time and I'll explain what they are when we get Good, there. Good, because I have no idea what you're talking about. Yeah, and I, I realize a lot of people <laughs> don't if, if, you're, if you're new and that's a new term. It's just the ability to go in and target individual pixels in various tonal and color ranges and just work very specific on those pixels in post-process. Okay. Yeah. Should we take the next picture? Yeah. All right, cool. Oh, wow. Yeah, that's cool. Okay, so this is from the same, um, I believe this is from the same vantage point um, yeah, or similar. I may be over at tunnel view. I can't remember. I think this was from the same vantage point. And this is with the 200-600 and I had a 2X Sony converter on that. So, wow. um, cool. No, this one I didn't because I'm looking at the lens data up there and it's telling me. Yeah. Yeah. Gotcha. I may have gone into APS-C crop mode on this. And okay. I, I want to make a mention on that because I get asked this at my workshops. Well, Oops, you sorry. know, you could just shoot it full frame and then crop at the computer. And my answer to that is always, I want to know exactly where I'm placing the boundaries of my frame. And so it, I would rather crop in APS-C and see the edges so I can make any fine-tuned adjustments in the field and not back at the computer. I'm, I'm very okay. much old style that I want to capture through the lens what I'm seeing and, and, and not come back to the computer and have to crop later. Gotcha. Yeah. Gotcha. Very good. So you're at F16 here, um, yep. sixth of a second. Sixth of a second. We had- Pretty cool. Yeah, and I stayed at ISO 100 because it was very calm. There was no wind at this point. If there would have been any wind, then shutter would have been become a concern, uh, especially with that big a glass on a tripod. But okay. uh, there was no wind, so I was very comfortable. And I always either use a remote cord. I think that night uh, I forgot my remote cord, so I set it in a uh, five-second timer. Okay. And, yeah, remote uh, cord's really important for what you do. Yeah, definitely. Right? I'm yeah, talk oh, about yeah. that just briefly, just yes. in case people don't know what that is or whatever. E either that, or you go to, you set your timer, your self timer on your camera to either two seconds. I have a rule. If, if, if I'm using the timer, if I'm using short glass, uh, 24, 105, 16, 35, I'll just go to a two second timer. If okay. I throw a 100, 400 or a 200, 600, we're going more up in the telephoto range. I'm going to a five second timer just to allow that lens to really settle down before that shutter is tripped. Gotcha. Gotcha. Yeah. Okay. You ready for the next frame? Yes. Okay. Ooh, Take me wow, down memory, cool. that could have been me down memory lane here. <laughs> this okay. is cool. This was when I started to swing into the valley now, uh, very near an area called the Pahomo Bridge. And uh, Pahono Bridge, excuse me. This is the Merced River in the background. And we had this little bit of dogwood tree right off the side of the road where I could get just my car pulled over to shoot. And okay. I'm standing up on a berm and I had my tripod virtually collapse to get it very high um, because I wanted to get as much as the base in there as I could along that bank. And um, so, it, the dogwood were very, very fresh. It's the best dogwood I've seen in years up there. And I, I'm well, here. You need to come to East Tennessee. We got all the dogwood you could shake a stick at, man. <laughs> <laughs> well, this, this is, is our dogwood I, out of here. This is all we, this is, we get this white dogwood. That's the one tree I know what it is, actually. I don't know <laughs> yeah. any, tree one, one tree from another, but this I know is a dogwood. Yeah. So this was 24 to 105. And then as I started shooting, I started thinking I didn't like the river frozen down. So mm -hmm. Um, I ended up popping a, a sing ray neutral density filter on there, a five stop neutral density filter. And what that does is it cuts the shutter speed down by five stops. And as you can see, I got a two second uh, exposure out of that. And that's what allowed a little bit of the motion of the water to, I, I didn't want it where it was completely blurred. I didn't want it where it's completely frozen. I wanted something in between. Yeah. And it's a feel thing. You just take pictures. And as I tell you, again, as beautiful as that electronic viewfinder is, to be able to review those frames and shut down my non-shooting eye, it's just like looking at a mini computer. Yeah. And It's uh, like having even, a big screen in your office. Oh, like It's to, amazing. It's right so you can see, yeah. 
I could see immediately the effects on the water and I go, no, that's a little too scratchy. I want to go a little more fluid. And I just finally dialed it in to where two seconds look just about right and um, had my picture. And again, because of no wind, that's how I was able to get all those leaves and branches just tack sharp. There was nothing yeah. bobbing around, not that's a cool. hint of wind that night. It was just a perfect evening to be shooting. Cool. Yeah, I was, th- I was just thinking just, you know, you and I, we both shot NASCAR and auto racing and there's always the, the magic shutter speeds it used to be 250th for NASCAR yeah. to get the wheel spin and the car sharp. And now we're looking at rivers and we're trying to figure out how to make a river look. It's kind of funny, you know. We're getting old, Patrick. <laughs> <laughs> it's uh, oh, it's gosh. <laughs> Ooh, wow, that is awesome. All right. Now, this is where this camera is really going to shine, you guys. Um this was taken at 10 o'clock at night, pitch black. This is from an overlook that probably a billion pictures or more are made of a year of Yosemite. It's called Tunnel View. It's the the probably the uh, most photographed from location. It gives you the complete overview of the valley. And let me just point out some of the main features here. To the left, that's El Capitan. We actually had a couple right of climbers. Yeah, that's it. We had a couple of climbers up there because their lights were on. I cloned out their little lights. Um, oh, wow. over to the yeah, over to the right is Bridal Veil Fall, and uh, yeah. yeah, that's Bridal Veil. And just above Bridal Veil is Cathedral Rocks. And then if we go right down the middle of the frame, there's a little dome up just to the right behind Cathedral Rocks. So the the next the there it is. That's called Sentinel Dome. Okay. And then to the left of that, come down right there is Half Dome. And just to the left of that is Clouds Rest right there. And they call it okay. Clouds Rest because it's, I think it's over seven, yep. 8,000 feet and there's always clouds sitting on top of it. But here, uh, oh, and then the mist coming up, that's just the mist coming up off the Merced River um, at night. So okay. when I pulled into wow. this overlook, there was nobody there. It was just me. It was pitch black. So when I went out, it's like who'd go there to shoot at night, Don? Yeah, well, (laughs) we've got the state of the art toys, don't we? Right, exactly. exactly. So I'm going to give you guys a little uh, a clue on how I do my night photography. Um, Inside the Sony cameras, I actually learned this from one of our uh, collectives in New Zealand a couple of years ago. We were out doing a night shoot on the South Island, New Zealand, and they said, "Hey, are you using bright monitoring?" And I said, I don't even know what bright monitoring is. I felt like the biggest fool. And they came over and set me up. And bright monitoring, I guess, gain, I, I, you know, I'm not a, I'm not an engineer. I don't know how this stuff works, but it gains the sensor. So if you're looking through the sensor without bright monitoring on, you'll get to a point, you just can't see anything, right? So I've tied bright monitoring to my trash can button. (laughs) And when I push it, it's like somebody flips a light switch and suddenly the sensor comes to life and it's um, you can, you can start to see everything just as you're seeing it in this picture. It's one of the coolest, most hidden tricks that Sony has put into their cameras. I don't know why they don't build a a campaign around it an advertising campaign for astrophotographers. It's one of the coolest things in the world. Okay. To having a camera, and I, I knew it was in the A7S3, it's in the A7R4, um, and it's in this camera. So I immediately set up bright monitoring, kicked it on, and uh, I'm basically seeing the image through my viewfinder as you guys are seeing it here. Now, if you look, I'm at ISO 200, I'm at F28 because I had my, uh, I think this was with my 16 to 35. Yeah, this it's was with my 16 to 35 yeah, F2.8 okay. wide open. It's a G Master lens, so I can shoot it wide open and with, you know, not worried about any softness and uh, a shutter speed of 30 seconds. So I'm getting a little movement in the stars. There wasn't much stars present. That's because just to the right of this frame, the moon was about to pop over the monolith just over to the right hand side. And if you just move into the top right, you see a little bit of what we call a moon doggy. It's the, it's the ice crystals refracting light that forms that circle around the moon. I think You're making that. that up, Don. Ice crystals. No, no. Really. <laughs> I mean, I, you'll see it on a cold winter's day with the sun. You can look at it and you can see the same effect. 
and it's called a moon dog. Um, I, it's something to do with the hexagonal ice crystals and how they refract light. And it, it even started to show up. It, it, you can see that it recorded it. I couldn't believe that. Um, it was just blown away. So, so I want to get this straight. So the light that's on El Capitan right now is the moon, correct? That's the moon that is lighting. And the dark, got the right side of the frame, the cathedral rock and all that, it's in darkness because the moon's behind it, right? Exactly. But it's... Oh my it, gosh, um, that is cool. But El Capitan, <laughs> this is how cool it is. El Capitan acted as a huge fill card and bounced the moonlight right. back over oh into Bridal gosh. Veil and Cathedral <laughs> Rocks. How cool that is that? That's crazy. That is crazy. We, you know, you and I have both done a lot of studio work over our years, yeah. but yeah. you got one light, be it a sun or a moon <clears throat> out in a landscape, but the same properties of light and reflection still carry through. So that's reflected moonlight coming back over to light up um, Bridal Veil Fall and the, and the mountains. I want to stop you just really quick because we've kind of lost our way. Now we're just gaga over the alpha one. <laughs> <laughs> what would this picture look like, do you think? How would it be different with A7R4? The A7R4 would do a pretty good job with this picture. I've got to admit. Okay. Um, okay. I still think my go-to camera for nighttime, well, I, I'm, I'm really in a quandary now. I don't know what it is. I, I bought the A7S3. Most people buy it for mm. video. I buy it because it's an outstanding astro camera, right, especially right. with the new 14 uh, one four yeah. lens. Now I got to use right. that up in Oregon. I was one of the, the lucky ones that got to test it. Um, but this camera can certainly hold its own every bit as good. And I think I, we already talked that, that, um, even with long shutters, like 30 seconds, you know, that sensor is heating up, but the noise, there was no noise. I didn't even run this through noise reduction. Yeah, that, so that was, wait, beauty. wait, are you saying that the A7R4 might have added noise because the sensor got A, hot? A7R4 would have been a hair bit, yeah, it would have been a little bit noisier, okay. in my okay. opinion, even at 200 gotcha. ISO, but wow. because I'm shooting at 30 seconds, I'm, I'm keeping yeah. that, you know, I'm feeding okay. that sensor. And oh, by the way, I wasn't shooting any of these in, in manual mode. I wish all of these were done with the electronic shutter. <laughs> no I just kidding. put it to auto. Yeah, and it just... Yeah. Wow. So, um, okay. Yeah. And if I need more time, uh, that's when I'll go on to just doing a timer and do a lockdown remote cord, something like that. But okay. I ran around the Valley because I knew the, the full moon was going to be up. Uh, the storm, you can see the, the storm has passed now, right? It, the clouds are off to the right. That's kind of looking, uh, well, looking right down the Valley, we're looking dead east. So we're looking okay. south as those storms were start, uh, the clouds were starting to clear out. All right, next frame. Oh, wow. Okay, this is another one. This was shot the very next location after I shot the previous frame at Tunnel View. I drove down into the Valley to a little bridge called Sentinel Bridge, and that's Half Dome. And this was probably now 1030 at night. And um, That's crazy. Uh, again, I was with the same setup, but I had to bump my ISO. And the reason being is I lost the moonlight because I was closer to a mountain off to the right that you can't see there. So it was getting dark down in that river. But the brightness on the river and the brightness on L uh, or excuse me, on Half Dome and the clouds, that was all moonlight because there's an opening back there that the moon was getting into. And so I wanted the sensation of when, when I'm when I'm processing a, a landscape shot, I'd like to have something bright in the middle to pull the eye. I want to I want to have my viewer's eye pulled into that frame. I want to take them for a ride through my frame. I don't want it to be static. So um, you know, I, I got a little bit of uh, perspective distortion here, and I could see that in my in my camera. You, that's where the trees are kind of angling in because I'm shooting with a wide angle mm -hmm. lens. Right. And I knew that was there. And I just thought, yeah, that's, that's kind of cool because that's helping push the eye right down the Merced towards River, right down point. towards. Yeah. Yeah. So right. these are all things that are conscious decisions. You can see I'm at 12 millimeters on this shot. So, yeah. you know, unless yeah. I'm shooting perfectly level, we're going to get some perspective distortion. And well, good job uh, of keeping your feet out of it, Don. That's good.
Yeah, and the 1250, <laughs> the 1250 ISO, I had to bump that up just again because the moonlight wasn't getting down into my foreground. Okay. So I had a very bright background on the raw file, but again, utilizing the luminosity masks, I was able to balance the whole frame out. Okay. Sounds yep. good. All right, next frame. Ooh, cool. Dang. Okay, now we're moving up till about, uh, this was the very next, these are all going in order, so I'm loving it. This was the very next stop. This is Lower Yosemite Fall. Man. And on a clear evening in April and May, when we get the full moon this upcoming month, I'm not sure exactly when the date of it is, uh, you get enough water, you can see at the base where it's kicking up the mist, you see the little, uh, mm -hmm. looks like a you little mist rainbow. bow back there. That's, yeah. that's, pre that's a moon bow. <laughs> moon bow. And Yosemite wow. Fall is one of, I think, three or four falls in the world where, you, where the moon lines up directly over your shoulder when you're shooting this scene. And we've, we've, had, we've been in a drought year out here this year in California, so we, there hasn't been a lot of snow in the high country, unfortunately. We got a little snow out of this one, but it, it, the, the fall, I've been there in years, Patrick. I'm standing on a bridge that's going over uh, this creek, and I've stood there in certain years where it's been like a torrential rainstorm. You're just getting absolutely soaked. Um, when I went up there, there was only two other shooters. One of them left, and it was just me in this scene and one other, one other person, and they left. And then I had this whole scene to myself, and I probably shot this till about, uh, what time is it here? 10, 24. I probably stayed till about 20 minutes past this, and then the angle of the moon got up too high, and the moon bow went away. But again, uh, you know, now you can see with the moon over my shoulder, I was down to 800 ISO, wide open again with that 12 to 24. It's a great lens. 30 seconds to get some movement in the water. And um, it's a, incredible. there wasn't a whole incredible. lot of processing that had to go on with this frame. This is pretty much, Unbelievable. Uh, you know, it, it, it took a little processing, but not a whole lot. Basically, if I, I didn't like see if I, if I didn't see the star with a little trail behind him, I would have thought this was shot at like, you know, five yeah. o'clock in the afternoon. Yeah. On a yeah. sunny day. You know, it's crazy. Yeah, yeah. it's it's, really it's really nuts. Cool. It's nuts. This... Hey, I want to uh, there's a question that came in from Daniel Tisdell, and he says, um, any thoughts on some of the features being carried over from Alpha One into A74 when it comes out? Um you know, we can't comment in any official capacity because we're not mm -hmm. employees of Sony. We have no clue when we, the we don't have any clue. coming or, or even if it's coming, you know, I'm, I'm sure it yeah. is, but who knows? One but of the, yeah. One of the, one of the great things is let's, let's both answer this one down, but I want to yeah. give a shot. It, Sony is so good at not holding back technology. Now mm -hmm. as a Canon and Nikon shooter going way back, Don and I both, you, they, you know, those two companies would often hold their best technology and only make it available in the high, more expensive cameras. Sony is constantly giving us things in the lower cameras, uh, like where mere humans can purchase, you know, that are coming from the high end. And so, yeah, I, agree. Yeah, I think, and the other answer I would give to this is, is to that you almost have to look at you have to look at not just the numbers on the front of the camera. You have to look at how, the age of the sensor. Mm -hmm. So like A7R4 at this point, I think is three years old. I think it was mm -hmm. November of 2000. And I'm trying to think if it was November of 2018. Does that sound right, Don? That's how, we were in New York together when they, when yeah, they we were. announced the camera. We were together. Yeah. So, so you go A7R4, then you go A92, then you go A7S3. Mm -hmm. Then you go alpha one. So and you're forgetting really, it's not even <laughs> a seven. I'm sorry. Yeah. It's not even yeah. fair to do what we're doing tonight. Cause we're comparing literally a four generation old sensor from a seven R four and the brand new latest possible technology that they, everything, every time they build a camera, they learn stuff Yeah, and they pack stuff into the next one and everything gets carried over to the next, next uh, camera. So yeah. Will the A7 IV, if they make it, benefit from the Alpha 1? You bet it will. Absolutely. Yeah. And, uh, you know, if they come out with an A7 V, um, yeah. Uh, and one of the things I've been pushing really hard 
um, probably to the point where Sony maybe is a little annoyed with me is to get focus stacking into our cameras. Because I, I, I know Canon has offers it and I know Nikon offers it and I'm not sure about some of the other brands. We really need in the world of landscape photography, I don't use a lot of focus stacking. However, the last two shoots I did, I've, had, I've incorporated it. I just did a shoot uh, two evenings ago where I incorporated some. And I think we need to be making that available in our cameras. And I, I think Sony's hopefully working on, again, I'm, we, we don't know anything, you guys. We don't know anything more than you guys. No. We honestly yeah, really don't. don't. Yeah. And if we do, and, we're on NDA. And when we know, we we'll know it. a day before that something's coming. And then yeah. come, we'll have to wait till the next day to find out. So yeah, honestly. All right, let's hit the next frame. Ooh, that is cool. Okay, so this is as I was leaving the park. This was probably at 1130 at night. And this is a lookout called uh, Valley View that used to be called Gates of the Valley. And this was one of the first viewpoints you used to come up to when you entered into the valley. And it's just a different look. That's the Merced River again. That's El Capitan on the left. You guys are getting it now. Bridal Veil on the right. Cathedral Rocks on the right. And now you can see Half Dome down the middle is kind of getting shrouded in clouds. Um, and we have this beautiful mist coming up. Now, when I pulled up, it's nighttime. All I see is the mist. And I see the moonlight hitting uh, El Capitan. Uh, and I just know I kicked that. I set that camera up on a tripod. Again, I'm the only one there. Nobody's dumb enough to be running around in the middle of the night out there. Um, although I will say that night, there were a lot of photographers because they knew about the moonbow. But these cameras, Patrick, with, the, with this bright monitoring, it's spooky good. If you guys have never tried bright monitoring, get on to that when you do your astrophotography. It, it'll okay. open up a whole new way of seeing. To sure. You. Yeah, it sounds cool. Yeah. Sounds amazing. Okay. Um, yeah, this picture, I just love the, uh, I guess I'd say the palette of it, you know, the palette of the, um, it's just beautiful how muted everything is. And, you know, um, it's, uh, you know, different. So number one, you're, you're, you're photographing in probably one of the most beautiful parks we have in the national park system, in, in my opinion. I mean, Yellowstone's right up there, Grand Teton's right up there, but this park this, this thing, it, it's hard to compare Yosemite with anything else. The Merced River's moving left to right here. So at 30 seconds, I knew I was going to get a nice soft feel to the water. Just, just as it's starting to get into more of the rapid part of it, th this section of the river is always nice and calm. It's great for shooting reflections in the fall when that river slows down. The river's moving kind of fast now because we're, we're getting so much snow melt from the high country up above. When you're in the valley, you're at roughly 4,000 to 4,200 feet. And then up where uh, the snow is right now is about 8,000 feet up in the high country. Beautiful, just beautiful. All right, let's go on. Uh, let's see here. Oh, wow. Okay, yeah, so this is, uh, this is gonna be the frame I'm gonna show you how I processed. Uh, this is from Tunnel View. This, this is actually a tree, this, this kind of magenta looking tree to the left, and it's called a Western Redbud. And I, in all my years of going to Yosemite, and I've been going there since I was a kid, have never seen a Redbud grow at Tunnel View. You, you usually find them down in the Merced River Canyon. Uh, I had never seen one there before. So to the left is the main viewing area, and you know, th this is, uh, this was now, let me see, four, uh, no, 7.30. I was about, about a half hour out from sunset. And my hopes were we were going to get the sun punching through and lighting up those clouds. The sun's sitting off to my left shoulder behind me um, coming up the valley, but we never did get the clouds lighting up. It just, it just didn't happen that night. But I walked away from the crowd because I saw this on a, on a monotone day, I'm always looking for something colorful I can put in my foreground because I, I wanna bring some life to that frame. So that's always my challenge on a cloudy or a, or, or a foggy overcast day. Find something, challenge yourself to find something in your foreground that's colorful, that breaks yeah. that sort of monotone-ish look. And that I'm gonna worked. show you, oh, go ahead. <laughs> 
I said, that worked. <laughs> the red yeah. one worked great. Yeah. And then I started to draw a crowd because uh, people, you know, you kind of break off from the crowd and everybody's like, what does this guy know that I don't know? And then when they came down, I, I tended to let people work in, but because I was there first, I'm like, I'm going to get make sure I got my shot. So I just moved around with the framing and the key was here is to make sure I wasn't blocking obviously uh, Bridal Veil Fall. And you see that one pine tree, fir tree at the base of Bridal Veil in the foreground there. By next year, I'll guarantee you that tree will have grown and probably will be covering up the base of Bridal Veil Fall. So that's okay. how fast these trees grow. But I'll, I'll show you how I went through in Lightroom and, and process and then how I brought out the color and tonality in Photoshop. Okay. All right, let's go to the next one. Oh, one last thing. This obviously is, was the 2414 because you're at one. This was 24105. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, the shutters. Oh, I'm sorry. The Wait shutters 1.6. I get it. Yeah, I got it. Yeah. Sorry about that. Yeah. yeah. And this could have been the 1635. Um, you know, I, I yeah, yeah. like I said, it seemed like Eon. That's cool. Well, That's high. Country. Okay. This sure. is, uh, <laughs> this was from where we first started that overlook when we were first starting to show these pictures. Mm -hmm. I was able to get so many pictures out of that one overlook and I probably used every lens in my bag shooting it. You know, it's funny when we go out and do workshops, I always, my, my number one question I always get is what lens are we using here? Yeah. And I think <laughs> it's taken me years to figure out what people are really asking me is, Hey Don, what lenses can I leave behind? My standard answer is yeah. if you brought it, bring it because right. there is, it, it, when we go out and create a landscape picture, uh, there's not a set formula. We're not out looking where's Waldo. We're, we're going out and looking at a scene and interpreting it as many different ways as we can figure out given the light and where we are at, how to, how to capture this. So this is one that I captured with the 200, 600 and the 2X converter. You can see I'm out the 724 millimeter and F16, 125th. I'm still down at 100 ISO. And this is when the clouds first started to part um, where, where these trees had probably just a half hour prior were getting coated with snow. And that, that snow line that you're looking at, that, that's the tip of Cathedral Rocks there. And uh, I would say that's probably about 8,000 feet at guesstimate. And I was standing, oh, I'm guessing here, maybe at 7,000 feet elevation. So that's incredible. Really it, beautiful. Don't be afraid. I keep, you guys I keep getting drawn to this green. The, yeah. Know, the yeah. Here. And that, that I helped along with uh, what we call a color mask. I created a mask for that. Uh, I'll show okay. you a little bit of that here in a moment. Okay. Not on this picture, but how we go about doing that to emphasize that a little bit more. But I want to make, before we go on, if that color was not in those rocks, I couldn't bring it out. That's not something I oh, I see. It in there. I see. Yeah, That's right. actually in there. I just helped it along with processing. Yeah. I understand. Okay. All right. Next frame. Wow. Okay. This is where I actually started the evening at uh, right around, well, let's see, it says 545. I was actually pulling into the valley. I pulled up and worked this area for about an hour. And um, this is a seasonal waterfall meaning that you're only gonna see this when you get the snow melt. And this is called Cascade Fall. And uh, it goes well up above this. And I've got frames of the whole thing, vertical, wide angle. Um, but I shot this, uh, you know, I had the 24105 and you can see I'm at 82 millimeters. So I'm, I'm standing on a bridge actually, and the water goes underneath me. And there's a whole beautiful scene on the, on the backside of this. But, I just wanted to get this sense, Patrick, because what I had been seeing through this camera, I talked earlier about this three-dimensional effect that I was seeing in the files. And I think more than any other file, uh, this gives you guys a good idea of what I was seeing. There's a luminance in those trees that the A7R4 would not have gotten. And I don't know wow. how what they're doing with this file to create this. Uh, this was a raw file, pretty much processed in Lightroom. I don't think I did any okay. masking adjust. Maybe I took the highlights on the water down a little, but that luminance of those trees, it looks like they're glowing. And it looked like they were glowing to my eye when I was shooting it. It was overcast light. Those clouds were still in from that storm. 
Yeah. Um, and uh, this file just, this is what just lit me up when I, when I was working this and seeing what I was getting, I just, I, you know, it's like I wanted to get yeah. on the phone and call up all my buddies and say, you're not going to believe what I'm seeing. Out of. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I just want to do a little commercial for the 24 to 105. It's not a GM lens, but man, it is an awesome. awesome it's an lens. awesome piece of glass. Yeah. Um, it's just so versatile, you know, it's just so versatile. Well, you know, and I, I worked with the 2470, which uh, Madra has now. I got him over on board with Sony. Uh, but this 24105, yeah, it is one of my most used lenses for landscape. And it, I know it's not a G Master, it should be. Yeah. It's yeah, that yeah. good. Yeah. All right. Next frame. Ooh, that's the this one was, that we all see. That's the one yeah. that I know. I'm in Tennessee, but I know this picture. You know. <laughs> Upper and lower. This is actually a pathway that takes you out to lower Yosemite where I shot the Moonbow picture. And there's three sections to Yosemite Fall. You see Upper Yosemite there lit by moonlight. The full moon was up hitting it. And then you can't see the middle section. They call the middle section of the falls Middle Cascade. You so can that would just, be up in here someplace? Just right in there. And then you just see the tail end of Middle Cascades, and then it comes okay. down to Lower Fall. Yeah. Uh, you would have to walk up a trail to your left about halfway up to be able to actually see Middle Cascades, and it's beautiful okay. in its own right. So there's three sections to Yosemite. Uh, people misconceive it. And they, well, it's called Yosemite Falls, but I've also heard it called Yosemite Fall because it's really a singular fall broken into okay. three sections. Gotcha. Yeah. And I just want to point out, this is shot at 11 o'clock at night. That's crazy. Yeah. Yeah. Look at the I time. Mean, it looks that. like 10, it looks like sunset, you know? It yeah. Uh, the lighting there on those trees, you might think that's headlights. That's the moon, you guys. That's the moon yeah. hitting those. Because look at the tree to the right, how, how dark it is because the moon isn't wrapping around but the moon's right. hitting the face of the falls and lighting the falls and lighting the trees. It's, it's just incredible. <laughs> and you want to go to the Smokies tonight, you know? <laughs> well, and I, I can't preach this bright, bright monitoring enough because okay. it's bright virtually, monitoring. if you turn on bright monitoring um, and you have focus peaking on those, I, I set my focus peaking the red, those stars are coming mm -hmm. back at me at red and the bright monitoring, it, it's virtually impossible to miss focus in the middle of the night. There, wow. there you go. Yeah. Wow. That's cool. You know? That's gorgeous. Love that one. All right. Let's see here. Oh, was that the last one? That might be the last one. I, you know, I actually, uh, yeah, I sent you 10. I sent 25 okay. frames off to Getty Images from this, this evening that I, sh I shot again from five o'clock to midnight. Okay. And <laughs> just, uh, just was amazing. Just, just, we have, amazing. we have actually been gaining people watching over the time we've already been on a little over an hour. And so okay. I'm, I'm glad there's like 45 people with us right awesome. now. So Hello, everyone. let's Don, let's slide into your toning. I want to see you tone yeah. the images and see what's going on. So go ahead and do your screen. All screen right. Give me a right. second here, you guys, and I'm going to switch over to, um, let me um, make sure. Are you still in Lightroom now? Yes. Okay. Um, I'm going to do this in two parts, and I'm going to explain what I'm why what I utilize Lightroom for, and then how I go through and I finish off my images in um, in Photoshop, and why I think you you need both. Uh, first of all, this basic module here is uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna liken this to building a house. This is where I'm going to set all my global adjustments, be it color and tonality. Okay. I probably do, oh gosh, 95 plus percent of my work in Lightroom is done okay. right here in the basic module. And I will, uh, now this is, you can see I'm leaving this right out of camera as shot, my white balance. People ask, do you set a white balance? Uh, no, I put it in auto white balance, okay. shoot yeah. raw mode. I don't shoot raw and JPEG. Um, I think the these cameras are so amazing in auto white balance. Um, and this is just a starting place for me, these files. So, you know, what you're seeing here is not what we're going to hopefully end up seeing when it's all said and done. 
I, I will also say when I work with my images, I, I could spend easily an hour on an image, you know, um, okay. sometimes I can go quick. Sometimes I, I can take longer. It just depends. Sometimes I can't quite see a file well enough. I'll get it to a point, I'll put it away for the day and I'll come back the next day and I'll see where I'm stuck. So I, I just want to preface that. You can see this shot I think we saw which was captured a half hour before sunset under cloudy skies, okay? The first two adjustments, I, I, I never start with the color balance. I just leave that alone. Uh, I come down here in the highlight shadows, whites and blacks. And if I hover over the nodule on each of these, if you look up in this histogram and it's important to have a histogram on, as I hover over the whites, you're gonna see a lightish gray tone on the far right of that histogram. Let me bring the pointer, the mouse pointer off of that. It goes away. Let me put it on, you see it. Conversely, if I come over to the black, it's hard to see because we got a big mound of data over there. Mm -hmm. So one of the things people, if they don't understand what a histogram's doing, I think, and I teach in my workshops, that histograms are one of the most important tools you need to understand. And they're very easy and basic to understand. They are representing this picture in terms of black and white, tones of black and white. From the far right, where we've got um, 255, 255, 255, and the RG red, green, blue pixels, and over here to 000, 000 in absolute black, and then everything in between. So we say it's representing a range of 256 tones because we're counting zero as an integer. Okay, so that's an introduction to, to histograms. I teach out in the field, I want every one of my students to have a histogram up on their camera and preferably the, the uh, RGB histogram so they can see what's going on in all three color channels where mm -hmm. the key for me is not to overexpose something to the point I can't get it back in processing. I can ex overexpose one of the three color channels, be it red, green, or blue, typically at a sunset or a sunrise. If you get a warm sky, it's gonna be the red channel. If I overexpose that on my camera, I can always get it back. If I'm overexposing two or more channels, I can't get it back. I've lost that highlight. So the first thing I will always do, and uh, I'm on a Mac, so I'm gonna hold the option key. If you're on a PC, you hold the alt key. Click on this, your screen's gonna go black and we're gonna set a white point. So I'm gonna pull that over until I see white and I'm gonna back it off until it all goes away, okay? So I've made a move of plus 22 points. This is important that we set a white and black point because when we go out to the print um, and, and assuming you're on a calibrated monitor, what you're seeing on your screen is going to carry through to the print. So let's set a black point now. I'm gonna uh, hold down on the option Alt key. And this time I, I'm gonna find the shadows and I don't wanna take them out. I don't wanna eliminate the shadows 100%. I wanna leave a little bit in. This is called in printer's term Dmax and that stands for density maximum. So every picture needs to have some Dmax in it. So the contrast looks correct. Okay, so when you're, just to review it, when you're correcting your highlights, you do wanna get them all under control. When you're correcting your blacks, you wanna leave just a tinge of them in. Okay. Now I've set the endpoints of my histogram. So now it's just massaging all that data in between. So I'm gonna take my shadows and I'm gonna open them all the way up. And I know this picture is looking flat. Uh, you can see how that histogram has shifted now. And I got a big mound of, of highlight data over here. So I can take the highlights down a little. And this is all to taste, Patrick. There's no sure. formula sure. on this. Uh, contrast, I'm gonna now come in because the picture looks really flat and I'm gonna bump a little contrast in. I don't wanna, I'm not gonna go too overboard in Lightroom because I'm gonna make my heavy changes in Photoshop. I'm just okay. trying to get a global overall balance and feel to this right. shot. Makes sense. Um, I think these, these um, shadows can be opened up more. So I'm gonna come here to tone curve. You get two types. You get the, uh, the legacy tone curve. And most people kind of get freaked out if they've never played with curves. 
So I tell them to go over here to the parametric curves and that you can hover over these lines now and it shows you what, what area of the, of the curve line you're affecting. And curves, guys, you, we read this from bottom left is your shadows to top right is your highlights, okay? So again, it just mimics what you're seeing in this histogram up here is mimicked down here. So I wanna open up these shadows a little. So I probably wanna to come to darks. If I came to shadows, I'm really restricted in what I'm opening, right? It flattens everything. So I'm gonna reset that and I'm just gonna push the blacks a little, just about, just about right in there, okay. Um, the only other changes I make, I leave my detail, my sharpening, I just leave it at default. That's Lightroom default. Same with noise reduction. That's all done later. This file really isn't noisy. It was shot at 100 ISO. It's not going to need any noise reduction. Lens correction, I always make sure. So it's telling me I did shoot this with the 24105. And I will always turn on remove chromatic aberration. But in these new lenses with these new cameras, there's honestly, almost nothing there. It's, yeah. There's nothing there. Incredible. I think chromatic aberration is a thing of the past, but yeah. for the heck of it, I just I just turn it on. This calibration is interesting. Uh, this is where we can go in and affect, uh, you know, the red, greens, and blues on a raw level. So, like, if I want to bring up that that magenta in this red bud was brighter than what I'm what I'm seeing on this raw file, so I could take the hue of that. And I could push it over a little bit like that, okay? And um, it just richens it up. But for the purpose of this demonstration, I'm gonna leave this alone because I'm gonna show you how I deal with this in uh, Photoshop. So what I'm gonna need to do now, Patrick, is share, I should have this picture, hopefully if I remembered. Um, give me a second here. Oh, I gotta come down. Hold on, I gotta come down here to my share screen and it's, I gotta get that out of there. Okay, I've lost you, I've done something here. <laughs> I'm still looking at your screen, I think. Okay, let me, um, for some reason I've lost you something guys. Something froze, it, it sort yeah. of froze. I'm, oh, now it's back. Oh, there it's it is, back. they move, okay, now I can go back to share, whew. Okay, you know, no worries. the beauty of doing these things live, you guys, yeah, you exactly. think we're so prepared, right? Now, <laughs> there we go. Now you should see Photoshop up, right? Okay, yeah. All right, I got to move this. I've got this palette of you and I up here. I want to move it out of the way. Um, I'm going to put it about right there. All right, this is going to look different, you guys, than your Photoshop probably, because I've added in um, a, pan a panel of extension, what we call an extension panel from Tony Kuyper, K-U-Y-P-E-R. If you go to goodlight.com or just Google Tony Kuyper or TK7. I'm these gonna panels put this in the up. comments. Okay. Yeah, and I, I'll just briefly go over what all this stuff is. All of this in here is nothing more than everything up here. It's just put into button form now. So I don't have to go hunting for it up here <clears> in the menus. Cool. Big time saver. Up in here is where all the magic starts to happen. This is where we're gonna okay. we're gonna get in and really take a look at things. So when I come out of Lightroom, I have to do an analysis, and the uh, the we're gonna work in sections on this picture, Patrick. And I I like to edit seat of the pants, so I could never re-edit this picture exactly the same way twice. Right. And, yeah. and I'll make the statement why I, I think it. mood factors into it. Um, you know, basically, how's your day going? If I'm in a good, relaxed mood, typically when I'm editing you guys, I got music going in the background. I'm relaxed. Um, I may have a glass of wine out. And that all is going to affect my mood and how I see this picture. Um, I'm doing a live demonstration. I'm a little more keyed up and not wanting to mess up and stumble. But uh, I'm going to break this picture down into sections. And the first section is going to be we're going to work on the sky. Then we're gonna richen up the color in this red bud. Then we're gonna to try to richen up the color in these trees and maybe get a little bit of more separation off this background in here. And then we'll see if there's anything else that needs doing along the way. So Photoshop, the first selection, I don't even have to go to Tony's Kuipers. I go under select and about six months ago, they added in this really cool select sky 
where it's one click and bang, they all, yeah. now you see the marching amps. Wow, and I, I want to cool. preface this, if you have a picture, because I've been working on some where it can't quite figure out where the sky is. So what I will do then is I'll come up and I'll find the subject and then I'll flip it over where I'll, I'll select the subject and then um, I can flip it over to select the sky. Okay, there's a, there's a keystroke in there that we can do. Um, so I've selected a sky. So well, what the hell are you gonna do with the sky, Don? Well, we're gonna come down. You're gonna see I have layers, palette and history. That's what I like to have up. And then Tony's commands up here, which we'll get into in a moment. I'm gonna come all the way down, follow my, my pointer all the way down to the bottom of the layer palette. And there's a fly up window. It's the same as what you would find over here under image adjustments, okay? But this is gonna do something a little bit different. Let me trash that, that wasn't what I wanted. Um, let's go back and reselect the sky. So I go to select sky, okay? Now I'm gonna, uh, what I wanna do is bump some contrast into that sky. So I'm gonna use a curves layer to do that. And now you can see that I have my curves box up. And if I hit the alter option key, there's the mask that Photoshop created. So in masking world, if you're brand new to this, anything that is white is going to get the full effect of the change I'm making. Anything okay. is black is not going to receive it. And you kind of see up in here, there's a little bit of midtones. It's going to receive a portion, a percentage of it. Does that make sense? Got it. Yeah. So let me get back out of the mask to full view. So now I'm going to come back over. And what I think I'll do, I just want to add some contrast into that sky. So I'll just come down here to medium contrast. And you can see it just set. I can play with these points if I want, but I'm going to come over here. I want your eye to just look at the sky and I'm going to go off, on, off, on. Okay. It's, it's pretty slight. I mean, we could come up here and we could go to strong contrast. I think that's a little too definitive for my taste off on, but Hey, I'm on a layer and I have an opacity slider so I can take wow. it down a little bit. That's cool. Okay. So I, I, I'm going to trash this. Well, I don't want to trash this layer. I'm still an active layer. I'll just come back and we'll just go to medium contrast. Again, all these moves are to taste. So mm -hmm. you have to do what works best to your eye, not, not necessarily to my eye. Okay. Number two, I want to deal with this redbud bush. So up here I have Tony's, uh, I, I could spend an hour and a half or two hours just trying to explain this whole little module here. So I'm going to give you the quick once over. It's broken down into three sections. You choose how you want to create your mask. We can alter or modify the mask in the midsection, and then we can output it to actually make the change. So I want to increase some of the saturation and color in this red button. So this is a cool feature that Tony offers called an infinity color mask. And what this means is when I open it up, you can see the color picker opens up. I'm going to bring my little eyedropper and just drop it on something in the red button there. And it's selected that color, which is fine. I'm going to click OK. And you can see now I'm wow. starting to get the outline <laughs> of the red button. So yeah, I'm going to modify cool. that and um, bring up that red bud. And now you're going to say, well, Don, you've selected all of that. Well, underneath, I got a white brush and a black brush. This is a mask, you guys. So I'm just, and I'm going to do this really quickly, Patrick. So I don't, I don't want to yeah. spend a lot of time be very delicate with this if I was doing it. But I'm going to mask out. Remember... Um, and I'm getting a little rough with this, but that's okay. You don't have to be exact with this. You yeah, I just want you to get the idea of what I'm sure. doing here. Now I've got to output this. So I have curves, levels, uh, co brightness, contrast, color balance down here. I'm going to come over here to hue saturation. This makes the most sense to my brain. And what I'm going to do now, you see the, the mask, the, march, the mask is in place, but you don't see any marching amps. It's mm -hmm. hidden. And I'm just going to tug on the saturation slider. Oh, and wow. look at how I can look at how that mask is just restricting my selection just to the red button. Um, yeah, let me go cool. in and show you the difference if that mask wasn't in place. Look at what it would do to the whole image. But the mask is preventing 
that change from falling across the rest of my image. It's not, this is why masks are so powerful. All right, let me go in now and try to deal with these trees. Um, I'm gonna come in maybe to a portion down in here and I can always move this around. It doesn't have to be exact. And uh, that didn't do a real good job of, that really didn't select anything. So let's, let's trash that and we'll start again. Let's go here. And this time I'm gonna come into the lighter greens and let's see if that's gonna help out a little bit. Still pretty dark. Uh, I'm gonna take the modification of the mask up. Now it's starting to select the greens. I'm gonna add a little bit more here. And now you can see I'm really, now I'm gonna back that blacks off. It, it's very seat of the pants what I'm doing. And I, my eye is just, again, whatever's white is gonna get this effect. So we'll call that good enough for now. I want to, um, I want to change the green or, or amp the green up a little. So I, I output it to a huge saturation. And with just those trees selected, you can see that the change is just gonna go out to those trees. And oh, by the way, I have a lightness slider here. I could lighten or darken to taste if you wanted to. Okay, that still isn't probably the best of masks. I would work on that mask, but again, I'm just trying to get, you know, get you guys to kind of uh, see what, what's going on. Um, now I think the overall picture needs to be lightened up a little. So I'm gonna come into the actual luminosity mask. I'm kind of going, coming at this in a different direction. I can select luminosity masks are broken into dark pixels, light pixels, and mid pixels. I'm gonna, I kind of just wanna work with the lights. So if I was to use a number one mask, what I'm telling that is, hey, uh, create a mask based on the 50% brightest pixels in this scene. If I went to number two, give me a mask based on the 25%, three, 12%, four, 6%, so on. Uh, I wanna work probably with either a one, I think a two, a two is gonna be pretty good. I'm gonna output this to a curves and I'm just gonna lift up on the curve line and yeah, now we're starting to get some punch back into that image, okay? Um, let me come down here and turn all of these off. This is the flat image that we brought it into from Lightroom. Here we worked on the sky. Now we worked on the red bud. Now we worked on the trees. And now we're working on the overall. Now, the last thing I'm seeing to my eye, I got a little bit of bright speckling Whoops, sorry, let me bring that up. A little bit of white up in here that I wanna control. So I'll just create another luminosity mask. Let me close this guy down so it doesn't confuse you. And this time we're gonna create a mask just for these brightest parts back in this part of the picture. So there we kind of got it. I've learned with these masks, if you think you've got it isolated, probably go one more. So I'm gonna go to a lights four and then I'm gonna output that to a curves layer. And this time, instead of brightening up, we wanna darken, so we're gonna pull down. And my eye is just staying over there to the left side of the image. I uh, don't worry about what's going on with the rest of the sky because I'm gonna show you a little trick. So I've got those whites now. Look at how much I've pinned down that, yeah. <laughs> that curves. Let me, let me go and turn off that mask and show you if that, I'm sorry, I keep doing that. If that mask wasn't in place, look at that, what it would be doing. But wow. with that mask controlling or guiding my selection, I, I'm really right where I want to be. And um, it's controlled that, but it's kind of made the rest of the sky look muddy. So this is the last thing I'm going to show you. This will really confuse. This is called masking a mask. So I'm going to add, <laughs> a, if, if you, <laughs> if oh, you see this little folder icon down here, it's also up here. And what it's done is I've created a group and in one click, it's automatically added this, this curves layer of the sky. Let me turn that on and off that we just worked on. So there was before, there's after, but I wanna retain that illuminance value in here. So I have a mask in place, but I'm gonna mask it now. So I have a white mask. <laughs> I'm gonna go to black, make sure my opacity on my brush is 100, my flow is 100 and I'm gonna paint the rest of that sky back to the way it was. 
where the mask was, was brought. I don't want to get back, see if I, I kind of got over in here too much. So I'm just going to take that back down again. And that's, you guys, is called masking a mask. <laughs> so this gets, uh, this gets kind of involved. I've actually committed now, I'm going to make a, a pretty self-deprecating announcement here, Patrick. Um, I've been debating for two years if I want to, I used to have a whole series of processing, how I processed out, and it's been off my site for well over a year. And I've had a lot of people ask me, will you come back and will you, will you, mm -hmm. will you re-record or redo one? So finally, uh, after much consternation, I have decided that I am going to start recording. It'll take me about two months. Uh, in fact, tomorrow I leave to go to San Diego and then on to Los Angeles for a while. So I won't even be able to start recording for about two weeks, but there, there will be one. Before I, before I exit this with all these little changes I made, the last thing I want to do, this little button that says ACR, guess what that is? Adobe Camera Raw. And I'm just going to reopen it and I'm going to check that I don't, I haven't blown any, any of my brights. Um, let me pull that across. Nope, they're all under control, except for maybe right up in those little dots there. And I want to go back and check my black point. Yep, that's about right. And any little last little changes. And maybe here, I might come down to effects and I might bump in just a smidgen um, of vignetting. I'm not one to go out and vignette every picture on a landscape. In fact, I, you know what? I don't think this one needs a vignette. And now I can click OK. And uh, you know, that's out of Lightroom. And that's with the localized changes all guided through these various types of masks. This isn't something you will learn overnight, any of you. This has taken me years. I've been with Tony since his version two. But with the COVID shutdown over the last year, I really got involved in trying to learn these masks. And a gentleman that works with Tony, uh, he's a photographer out of Oregon named Sean Bagshaw, puts out a terrific series and I'm working through his masterclass series now. Um, and he's really the guru on, on, on all of this stuff. Uh, he'll, he'll take you so far in depth, your head will spin, but he's an amazing guy. And um, so that's what I've been working on. I, people ask me, hey, do you use Luminar or any of the AI technology? I certainly do. I love the new AI technology. But guess what? I'm using it all with masks. <laughs> okay. I may come in and use uh, Topaz Sharpener AI, but I will create a mask and I will only sharpen what's down in here. I'll leave the sky alone. Or conversely, I might use Topaz Denoise AI and I will select the subject and just make sure that I'm denoising the sky where, you know, but in this picture, there's really, there was no noise. So there was nothing no. to worry about. So that's kind of my workflow, you guys. You can see it, it gets pretty intensive, but the more comfortable you get with this masking, it's the umph control, because you're, you're, it's a pixel-based selection. And you saw how, I mean, it just went in and picked the pixels. So um, there's, there's no sharp edges, there's no haloing, there's no artifacting, and you can really dial right in on what it is that you, you want to work with. Probably the last thing I would do with this is I would grab, now that I'm looking at it, and this is why you want to linger with pictures, I'm, I'm, going, to, I'm going to brighten up that waterfall a little because I think it needs to stand out. So I'm going to take my flow down, maybe to about 10. Let's try that. And mm. just do a pass yeah, it really or two. pops better now. Yeah. yeah, now let me take that off. And see how the eye is sucked right into the frame? This is what I'm talking about. And again, if you think that's over the top, you can, you, you can control it through your opacity slider right mm -hmm. about maybe in there. And I just keep doing this. I just keep turning these eyeballs on and off until I, you know, until it resonates with me and I think I've got it. So that's, uh, that's kind of the direction I'm at with my uh, workflow, Patrick. And I think you just disappeared on me here. <laughs> no, no, I'm here. Oh You're yeah, here. actually, I think my camera went down. So my camera, okay. but uh, you can still hear me, right? I can hear you. I, do you, I, I can okay. hear you, but I don't see you. <laughs> yeah, that's okay. Um, the important thing is that um, uh, I, I just 
so appreciate you taking the time to do this, Don. I really do. And um, I've learned a ton tonight. I really have. Awesome. Um, I, I did put uh, Don's website into the chat. So I will also put that into the, um, the description of this so that if you want to, you know, wait, just keep checking, you'll find his videos will pop up eventually on his website. And also yeah. I put goodlight.com in there. I don't know about Topaz. Is it topaz.com or what's the... Topa yeah, if actually, if they go to my website, Patrick, and on my homepage to the left, you will see a, you will see a link for discounts and affiliates and all my software. Oh, awesome. So yeah, go to Don's website only, and then you'll be able to go yeah, from there. I've got codes to Luminar and to Topaz and a lot of... And Perfect. Singray, Perfect. which is all the filters yeah. I use. So uh, they're so all just, there on the just again, give, Let's just end this thing. But what I want to do is get you... I want to give you an opportunity to just talk one last time about the Alpha One, um, oh, and what it, how it's impacting your work. It it's um, bar none the best ca camera on the planet. I think I wrote that in a blog or I said that on a video somewhere. And the more I use it, the more I stand behind that statement. I've just shot with it two out of the last three nights and um, two days up in Yosemite and you're see, you've seen some of the results. And the more I use it, the more I'm just blown away by what it can do. That's awesome. And I'm finding the same thing in portrait and sports, uh, birds in flight. This is kind of a new thing I'm getting into too, but uh, I'm just so happy with uh, my A1s. I just don't, I just, I just don't know if, if, uh, if Sony thinks I'm going to be buying another camera anytime soon, I think they got another thing coming. Though. That's the only problem. So <laughs> can I add one more thing, Patrick? Cause you yeah, know, sure. I, I shot sports for years. And when I got back from this Yosemite trip, I took my oldest son and his friend who were both college golfers out to, uh, the practice area at our local club out here. And I wanted to shoot that, that kind of, um, really tight shot where they're, they're in a bunker and the sand's exploding. And so at 30 frames a second, the camera immediately would find the eyes, right? The eyes and the face. This was the scariest thing. When, when, the, when they would splash that sand and that sand would explode, typically an autofocus camera would grab onto that sand and jump off their face. And this camera held right on the face <laughs> and knew that it shouldn't jump over to the sand. Do you know what I'm talking about? You're, and I was shooting them with a, the 100-400 at 400 millimeters. So it's a, it's a tight frame. It's on my blog site if you want to go see it. Just absolutely amazing. Frame after That's frame crazy. after frame. It knew to stay on that face. Uh, yeah, I'm I just wish I was still it. shooting hockey and I could use this camera for hockey and the strobes and the SAP arena in San Jose. Because we now yeah. have one four hundredth of a second sync speed, Which and is um, it just yeah. is, <laughs> you know, the technology is just so incredible. Um, you know, uh, I'm at that age where, you know, sex doesn't like me up too much anymore. But boy, cameras sure do. <laughs> <laughs> well, Don, I think we'll end on that note. Uh, but I, but I do, I just so appreciate, you know. Mm -hmm our longstanding friendship. And I love that we're able to be artisans together and that we get to see each other and travel sometimes. And yeah, may we all be traveling again, like we used oh, to in the, in the, in the immediate future, please. you know? Uh, so thank you so much for taking the time. And um, I'm hoping this has been helpful for those of you that are, that have the A7R4 and are really thinking about the Alpha One. I think it's really worth looking hard at. It may not be the thing you need to do financially or whatever, but um, it's definitely worth uh, looking at. But thank you so much for watching. And uh, I'm about to hit end unless you have anything else to say, Don. Thank you. I'm it. No, no. Thank you, Patrick. It was a pleasure. Sweet. And hopefully yeah. you and I can get together in the near future here and see each other in person. Man, I hope so. Because I miss my Sony family. I'm telling you. Yeah. Really yeah. Good. I hear you. Thanks, buddy. I appreciate you. All right. You take care have and enjoy night. your evening, everyone. Okay. Bye-bye. Thank you. See ya.